Hello and welcome to session 1 of day 1 of the 4th annual completed life conference entitled reimagining the end glimmers within life care. It's such an honor to welcome Dr. Jessica Zitter MD back to our virtual stage. Thank you so much for being here, Jessica. Oh, so pleased to be here with you. So I, th I thought we would begin by going back to the very beginning of your medical career where you wrestle with the Hippocratic Oath. Um, in your book, Extreme Measures, Finding a Better Path to the End of Life, um, you wrote about uh, back in 1992 when you recited the following upon graduating from medical school. You wrote, I will remember that there is art to medicine as well as science, and that warmth, sympathy, and un understanding may outweigh the surgeon's knife or the chemist's drug. As I said these words, eyes watering, I had no idea how difficult it would be for me to adhere to the oath I was taking. Can you describe that feeling of eyes watering as you took that oath? What did you anticipate awaited you in medicine? Wow, what a great, wonderful question. Um, I really do remember that that day. Um, I remember feeling this call to my fellow human beings. Um, a desire to bring good to the world and compassion uh, to my fellow human beings and to have skills that would allow me to do that and training. And I felt so privileged uh, to be entering into that world where I was going to be trained to care for other human beings. And um, all of those intentions have stayed with me to this moment to this moment right now. The problem is that in life, there are so many forces around us that shape our behavior and shape our thinking. So even those sort of underlying deep, deep values that I felt that day in my fourth year of medical school, at the end of my fourth year of medical school can get twisted. And mine got twisted as I believe many who go through medical school and residency training and fellowship into really believing that intervening on the body, which is what we're trained to do in medicine, it's, those are the hard things that they train you to do, was really a substitute for all caring. And, it, and it, it, the problem that I didn't realize was I got in so infatuated with doing things to people with you know, playing with catheters and and intervening that I sort of was taken away from the human beings. Um, truthfully, there was so much pain in caring for people with serious illness. There's so much pain in caring for people who don't have serious illness, but who just have the pain of life around them that human beings sometimes can't process all of that pain. And to have a set of skills and interventions that you can turn to can feel like a way to keep moving forward without being engulfed by pain. And the problem is that that, as we know, uh, can be a, a faulty thinking and can end up causing more harm than than good. Right after that uh, kind of eyes watering quote, you say, um, with the intense focus on curing disease, as you were just mentioning, um, down to its most esoteric tributaries, using the most sophisticated tools imaginable, I objectified my patients. Um, and I was really stunned by this sentence, rereading the book, you know, many years after I first read it, particularly um, in how the oath that you took hinted at this potential dynamic of, of really seeing the patient as um, something to fix and, and not necessarily zooming out as seeing them as a whole person, a whole, you know, from a holistic perspective. And it, it, it really seems like you wrestled with this and in, in the beginning, did you experience this shift just as sharply? 
I mean, no, it, it, it the, the, the shift happened gradually. Uh, I think in the beginning, and I write about this in my book, I felt so unhelpful. I would witness this terrible suffering and I would watch as those who were ahead of me in their training had things to do an arterial blood draw or inserting a catheter. And I didn't know anything as this young sort of medical student. And um, as I started to gain some of those skills, I felt like they were substitutes for my caring. I also, by the way, didn't have training to process grief and to process suffering. That's something that comes after years and years of witnessing it day after day after day. And frankly, required being trained to do that. I mean, I, I, had I not fallen into the palliative care movement, I'm not sure I would have found these other tools, the tools of presence, the tools of listening, the, 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 those, those tools, which the term, the tools of spiritual, um, uh, witnessing and, and, and spiritual valuing of a person. Those are things that I, I, I also didn't have as a young medical student. And, and the problem is when you then take these new skills that you're building in medical school, you, those other things that you really should be building around spiritual and, and psychological support of your patients, they atrophy because you start to focus on these things that you can do. It's a little kit. You open up the kit, you do your procedure, and then you move on and you've done something and you can sort of start to think, oh, I did something. But by not cultivating those, those, those incredible skills, the more in some ways important skills of really being there for a person and their experience with serious illness, we end up leaving that whole thing aside and we really end up ignoring some of the most important healings that we should be, that we should be doing. You mentioned falling into palliative care and in the book you describe it as converting to palliative care. And was there a particular moment or experience with the patient that really prompted you to perhaps take a, a sharp pause um, and really question how medicine is practiced on the one hand to save a life versus how medicine is practiced at the end of life? I would not say that I converted quickly. Um, I converted a little bit kicking and screaming. Um, it took years of being around the very early stages of the palliative care movement. Um, and I felt a lot of resistance, um, a lot of resentment um, and defensiveness. And what's interesting is that it, that experience of, of being a reluctant convert, it took me a long time. And I can tell you about the moment when I did have that final, like, wow, epiphany. Okay, now I'm ready to do something new. That same thing is, uh, that same process happened to me years later, a couple of decades later, around issues uh, of race and racial equity in healthcare. And understanding the role that I myself play in uh, bringing racial inequity to, to patients of color under my care. And that was another um, difficult conversion that I made, but I did make it. And in both of those situations, converting into the philosophy of holistic care and understanding that treatment interventions aren't the only way to care for people, starting to understand the value of conversation, communication, and other types of healing, but I got through the palliative care movement and my uh, my experience in learning more and 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 value and and sort of being a witness to the horror the horrors of of racial inequities in healthcare. Both of those things were there were two women, Pat Murphy, who you've probably heard me talk about, the nurse who brought me into the palliative care movement in the early two thousands, and Chaplain Betty Clark, who really over again, a lot of struggle and a lot of resistance on my part uh, became my guide into understanding equity in healthcare. Um, so both of those were not easy won battles and those are things that I have spent my career now trying to bring to my other colleagues, um, all well-meaning people just like myself, but it takes, it takes effort to start to see things in a different way than what you're used to seeing things uh, do. And, and that's, that's the focus of this next film that we're making 
um, the chaplain of Oakland. Can you describe that moment with you alluded to a patient? Was it a particular patient? Yeah, it was a it was a very particular patient. Um, it was a very particular moment in time. Um, the palliative care team again that was in the early days. We we didn't know what palliative meant. It was called, they called themselves the family support team, led by a very strong nurse named Pat Murphy, who's still a very dear friend of mine, um, would come into the ICU and and they would just, you know, tell me all, you know, you're not, you're not being clear about that patient's prognosis. Why are you not treating this patient's pain? All of these things. And I was like, who are you? What are you talking to my patients? It wasn't the way things were done. It wasn't the way I had been trained. You know, there was a certain hierarchy in healthcare about who gets to talk to the patient, who owns the patient. I mean, I'm not proud of this. This is just the way it was in the late 90s, early 2000s. And uh, one day I was putting a Quinton catheter into the neck of a, a patient who was dying. I mean, she, I knew she was dying and I knew that our dialysis that we were, the next sort of thing that we were gonna do to this woman wasn't going to save her life or, or, or help her in any significant way. And I knew it was gonna cause her pain, but that was just my next step to do. And that was how I had been trained in this sort of protocolized way. And Pat came into the room and saw me putting this thing in and she knew who this patient was and she knew that I wasn't helping this patient. And she looked at me and she just goes like this, call the police, they're torturing a patient in the ICU. And that, that moment, um, it's so much more complicated and I, I describe it in so much more detail in my book, but not only did I all of a sudden, it, it just clarified, I knew she was right. I had been feeling so guilty about doing this, but it was the only thing I knew how to do and having her say this, as defensive as I could have felt, I just felt this incredible shame. And she's right. But the problem was there was nothing I could do. I was in the middle of this procedure. The medical student was waiting for me to put this line in. The nurse, the dialysis nurse had just pulled this, you know, they put us to the top of the list to do this urgent dialysis. Everyone's waiting for me to do this procedure. I could not, I could not see a way out of it. And so I did put that line in. But it was probably one of the last times that I did a procedure that was going to cause terrible harm to somebody and no benefit and didn't do something different, whether it was to try to talk to the family, to try to talk to the team and say, I, are you sure? Should we be reassessing this decision to try to, uh, or at least to talk to myself and say, I'm in a situation right now where I have no choice for a variety of reasons that are complicated, but to put this, this in, I don't believe it's the right thing to do, but I at least want to sort of register with myself that I don't think we should be doing this. That is, those were, those were, that was, I would say that's where things changed. After that one patient, my whole life took on a different trajectory and I did not see interventions, non-beneficial uh, interventions as um, a benign, uh, or positive thing anymore. That brings to mind what you describe in the book as the end of life conveyor belt of um, bringing in all of these me life saving medical tools that may or may not benefit the patient at the very end stages of their life. Um, how how have you reconciled perhaps with the end of life conveyor belt in in light of the tools that you've added to your toolkit that you mentioned presence and spiritual witnessing and spiritual valuing. Can you elaborate a little bit further on what it means to really witness a patient by the bedside? Yeah. Well, first I want to, I want to make it really clear that end of life conveyor belt is not synonymous with the ICU. There are so many appropriate uses of technology. There are so many times when you don't even want to talk about it. You just need to do it. It's clear. There's a chance it will be of benefit. Um, or somebody, even if you don't think it's going to be a benefit, someone clearly wants that type of intervention. So I don't want to go on record sounding like I think all ICU care is bad. I don't. I think it's wonderful. I've saved many, many people's lives with it. And I feel so grateful to have those skills. Um, the end of life conveyor belt is a concept that is really reserved for use of those types of interventions and technologies in a default 
type of approach and a protocolized approach that really isn't taking into consideration the patient, their diagnosis, their prognosis, and most importantly, what they want. That's when it becomes the end of life conveyor belt. How have in expanding your your toolbox to include things like presence and and spiritual witnessing and spiritual valuing, and I I thought that distinction was interesting. Of, and I'm wondering what the difference between those two things is. Um, how how that's helped you kind of reconcile the kind of extreme measures that happen within the ICU that may or may not lead to an end of life conveyor belt? I would say that um, I've had to work just as hard, maybe harder, to curate these other tools um, because we don't focus on teaching them in, in healthcare. And so learning how to be present, present with suffering and how to bear witness to someone's suffering and how to elicit values and preferences and the deepness, the depth of a person's sort of soul, those are things that also need to be taught. They're not things that you just absorb and develop over time in, 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 in medicine. In fact, I would say unfettered medical education, you're probably going to lose those skills more than, than when you first came into medical school. I think that they are skills that need to be taught and valued just as much as putting in lines and intubating people. And I've learned those skills through the palliative care movement. Um, I've learned them through all of the communications, um, all of the communications skill teaching that I've not, not only experienced as a, as a learner, but also as, as a faculty, you know, for vital talk, et cetera. If you learn the skills of communication, there's some, you know, protocols for that, frankly, it gives you space to calm down because I'm gonna tell you something, Watching someone suffer is frightening. And it's frightening to see somebody suffering. And if you have skills to rely on, the way we had our arterial blood gas skill, oh, I can go do this and I'm helping. If you have skills more benign, I would argue, that are just like, take a breath, stop, don't talk. That's a big one, because we're big talkers. You can hear, I'm a big talker really let the space ex experience the space between you and this person let this person know that you're you're in their space as much as they want you to be in your in their space that you're here that you're not running away and that's hard because we're busy right we're busy but making a patient feel that you are truly with them and that you are truly focused on being with them. Yes, you're going to have to leave in five minutes or 10 minutes, but you're still here right now with that person. Those are just things that require practice and require having a protocol for communication, which gives you some space to take in a deep breath, slow down, and be in that space of suffering that we so want to run away from. When we teach our students vital talk, skills, which is communication skills with patients. It's so fascinating to watch young, young students. They, 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 the, the actor, the patient actor is, is exuding suffering. And these young doctors, they just want to run away or they just want to keep talking and we're telling them, well, we're going to, well, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And that mo that the biggest skill that I think we can teach people in those moments is to stop talking to just sit and to just listen. And what that does therapeutically for patients is really profound. And it, you do it a few times and you start to see the impact on your patients and you realize, wow, they just need me here. Beautiful answer, really. Just stopping and, and listening and holding space and being present, you're embodying being present. Yeah. And it's almost as if you're re- directing the narrative and reimagining a different narrative towards you know from paternalistic medicine historically towards well you're there to be with the patient to be their guide medically but really there for them 
Yeah. And they're the expert on themselves, not me. So if mm -hmm. I want to really, you know, I may be the expert in medical stuff, but I need to collaborate with them as the experts in them. Um, mm -hmm. We can't do this alone. They can't do it alone and I can't do it alone. It's a really beautiful way to, to reframe the patient provider, you know, dynamic and that narrative and shift kind of a, a embedded power dynamic um, towards the patient, like you said, is is at the helm of steering their own ship. Tell me a little bit about how kind of in this reframing you work with other team members in within palliative care um, for physical, emotional, social support for the patient. Oh, that's such an important uh, point. It's not only to provide holistic um, care for the patient, it's to provide care for us in order to do this work. And this is something, again, that I learned both, you know, in the beginning from the palliative care movement, but then as Chaplain Betty Clark and I started to be very close from her. In healthcare, in medical circles, in medical culture, there is a really distinct hierarchy of who is more important on the care team. And it's, first of all, just from a social justice perspective, it, that's horrible. Like that doesn't feel like the way any good care is. It doesn't feel like good care for a patient can come out of that type of environment. Um, but also, it's really, I will tell you from the perspective of the person who's quote unquote, and I mean, I don't, the reality is like the ICU doctor is sort of like, okay, I'm at the top and the chaplain, oh, she's doing, you know, nice to have. No, Betty brings, if I had to give a percentage, I mean, I would say she brings 80% of the healing into the room that I, that I do. I'm, I'm peripheral. I wrote an article actually for the American, um, uh, it was called Being Relevant. And it was really looking at this question of hierarchy and of how I always felt how I was so relevant because I, I was this person who was doing the most important stuff. And um, what I realized really, as I started to understand what it is that's most healing and what's most important, which is again, the witnessing and the valuing of the spirit and um, the the holding space and non-judgment and all of those things that chaplains are so much better at than we are. Um, I started to understand, like I, I realized that I'm not, you know, I, I struggle. I want so badly to be relevant. That's just what my, you know, my, my self-image as a doctor when I started to sort of, the table started to change and I started to see how important her work was and how peripheral I often felt in the room when what the patient needed was really something she was so much more skilled at offering than I was. And I started to have this like identity crisis. Well, geez, you know, am I even doing anything? And she actually said to me, I said, you know, I, I said, I, I don't even know what I'm doing here as a palliative care doctor. In the ICU, it's a little different because there's so many procedures, but in the palliative care world. And she said, you know, we have to be doing this as a team. The, the patients want their doctors there. And I can't do my work if I'm not working at your side. And I, because I had been saying to her, I can't do my work. You're doing all the work here. So th this feeling of this interprofessionalism, it's not just a nice to have, it's not this kumbaya, it's not this anti-hierarchy social justice thing. It's actually extremely practical, not only in terms of providing truly the best combination of care, but also making each member on the team feel like we're truly delivering care in the most just way and that we're not the only person who is responsible for everything. I, I lean on her, she leans on me. That's, that's one of the things that's crumbled in my mind is the sort of concept of who's more important, who's doing the more important stuff in the hospital. Mm. It's really changed for me. Well, it really focuses on kind of what's most important as a 
what's most meaningful, what's most serving of the patient. And it sounds like um, Chaplain Betty and Pat Murphy were two different strong personalities that really helped shape and guide you forward. Can you share a little bit about their different personalities? And oh. <laughs> they're both, uh, well, they're both women in their late 70s. Um, they're both, they're both people who come to this work. I would say Pat, Pat is, a, she, I joke about this and she always laughs, but she's kind of a rabble rouser. Pat is just, she is, she's a person who's a truly angry about injustice. And you know, she's, she is not when she, she calls everything out as she sees it, she's just one of those people, you know, she's brave. She's not afraid of what people think and what the countervailing political winds are saying you should say. And she says what she believes. She's very strong. And, and, and this work of palliative care and holistic care and not just doing things by protocol and, and not having a hierarchical environment. These are all things that I think everyone would agree on. But in the days when she started doing her work in the 90s, mid 90s, she was really, and to this day, we still have so many pockets of that kind of thinking. But she was out there saying things that were pissing people off left and right. She didn't care. She figured out what her North Star was and she knew her North Star was it's about the patient. It's not about the doctor. And she was right and she would say it and she made a lot of enemies, including me. I was, I found her to be difficult and abrasive. And you know what? God bless her because she was so brave. She did something that was so brave and she allowed me to be brave myself uh, in her shadow, in her wake. I don't know if I hadn't had someone like her if I would have felt the bravery to do what I needed to do, what I did in my, I mean, she's still, you know, she's, she's still rabble rousing and doing her thing. And, and, and so am I on my end, but she was, she, she was one of the first people who walked into the water and said, we're doing this. And, and I, I, we need people like that. Betty is a different, Betty's a different kind of person. Betty was a sharecropper. She grew up in rural Kentucky. Um, she was the first person to integrate her white high school. The stories that I have heard about racism, I mean, and to this day, of course, but, but the stories, the, the, the Jim Crow Kentucky stories are horrific. Um, and like Pat, Betty also, she was a rabble rouser. She is a rabble rouser. Betty does not, she does not keep her mouth shut. If she sees something wrong, she says something. She will say to our entire team, I don't like the way you're talking about this patient. If she hears anything that sounds like bias or, 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 or if she, if she sees treatment that she thinks is inequitable, she says she'll go and complain. And that too can be really hard for people in the status quo to take including me. And because of her bravery and her speaking truth to power, including me, I have had, I, I feel that I have, she's given me the mantle. You know, she's, she's made it sort of an imperative that I, that I follow in her wake. So I have these two really strong, strong women who are so my, strong. So strong and so brave and so just, I'm so proud to be their friends and um, mentee. Thank you so much for sharing, you know, two such powerful women who really speak truth. It's almost as if like this electricity, electricity is coming through them yeah. and they can't help but, you know, speak it. And it's powerful and it's dynamic and it's life changing and it really impacts for the better, the community in there, you know, around them. Um, and I know you're not only an amazing doctor, but also a filmmaker. How does 
telling these these stories with such truth and compassion and and also candor how does film allow you to to open up reality to a broader audience how does that tool help you in your work a picture is worth a thousand words a movie is worth a thousand books i think human beings really I'm, literature, obviously, poetry, I mean, all of these things have served to inspire the human being to be their best self over millennia, 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 art, etc. And I think now is the time when our healthcare system is in such disarray and people's humanity is being ignored and people are suffering so much unnecessarily. I feel that we need to revisit this approach to moving people. Data, journal articles, lectures, they all serve a purpose, but we are in need of a massive infusion of humanity into our healthcare system and into the teaching of our healthcare providers. Because as you heard me describe, it is very easy, if not morally distressing, but very easy to separate a person who's trying to come and help from their humanity because of, if you don't prepare them to manage and face suffering in a deep way, they will go off and do things well-intentioned that can actually end up causing so much more harm. And so we've got to bring back this effort to train our young doctors and nurses and all the other healthcare professionals to really prioritize humanity. And I think film in art and poetry and all of those things are the way to do that. And I think stories, you know, the human brain fastens in fast, you know, it, it, it hears a story and it feels something. Unfortunately, a lot of us hear stories and then we kind of don't have the data to back it up. And a lot of times we end up using these stories and these anecdotes in unhelpful ways. So I think pairing a story, which I call emotionally priming, and then pairing it with true data and strategies that have been shown to be effective to take your emotional experience and your emotional priming and move it into something productive. I don't believe in using story and film just in by itself uh, to move people and because uh, I've seen that cause um, serious damage. Um, so what we want to do here at Real Medicine Media is we want to continue to create stories, tell stories and use them in a way that is extremely productive and data-based uh, to then take the story, the heavy lifting that that story has done and move it into action so people are doing things to really improve uh, these some of these terrible things that are happening. Um, and that's what we're working on right now. We're really excited. We've, we've created a concept note around digesting the films that we're making into really still very powerful cinematic experiences that are much shorter um, that are then paired with some kind of didactic, a small thing, something small that somebody can do and, and a little bit of background information about the state of whatever it is that that particular module is addressing um, and really bringing that to physicians. That's that's our current, um, wow. in addition to finishing up the, the Chaplain of Oakland, which we are really excited about, um, it, we, we want to really work on this medical uh, education innovation pilot to really try to get these these types of prototypes created and then eventually to build out a whole encyclopedia of many things, whether they be looking at things around thinking about implicit bias and the impact on racial inequities, thinking about the fear of communication and getting emotionally entangled with your patients and how that impacts decision making in the ICU, things about understanding the presence of caregivers and, and 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 when we ignore caregivers what ends up happening in our society i mean there's so many different modules that we would create but we want to we need to sort of do this initial pilot and and make sure that it works and that we're using it in a way that's going to really impact change and behavior change uh, thanks for sharing all of that I'm, I'm so excited to hear about that being conveyed to medical school curricula on the one hand and i'm wondering 
um, how can we, uh, and maybe you have plans for this already, how can we bring this to the, the general population? Because I'd love to see like a, a patient decision-making guide. Yeah. How would you ideally like to redefine these conversations with film for say the 16 year old who's just gotten their driver's license who can check yes on, yes, I wanna be an organ donor. A hundred percent. We have decided with this first uh, level prototype that we're trying to create that we're going to focus in on ICU doctors. Why? Uh, because we believe right now, if we're talking about low hanging fruit, doctors are a bigger lever than lay audiences for changing the system. I really believe that. I really believe that we, from an urgency perspective, we need to educate doctors to do better, to do different. And so we're this first iteration that we're doing is going to be um, um, a small series of things focused on ICU doctors. Why? Because I'm an ICU doctor, because we have connections in the ICU world. In my dream, we are extending this to all, certainly all healthcare professionals and eventually to the lay community as well. But we need to figure out how to make this prototype in a way that is going to be most impactful and really uh, cause the change that we want to see. And so we're starting with this very small this very small pilot. If you don't mind, I'd like to pivot a little bit to some California-based um, policies and how that affects your experiences in the last seven years or so. So as you know, at the Completed Life Initiative, we really advocate for a patient's right to direct their own end-of-life experience from, from a, and that ranges the gamut from voluntary stopping eating and drinking to palliative sedation to um, mm -hmm medical aid and dying, and, and also, of course, including palliative care and hospice care, really empowering the patient to um, feel like they can take in all of these tools. Um, and I like to call it the completing life toolkit, uh, where it's a, a framework within they can feel fully educated to and then empowered to make the best choice for them um, with the help of, you know, their medical care team, multidisciplinary right. care team, of course. Um, how does this framing of a completing life toolkit fit within your your perspective on end of life medicine? I know um, mm -hmm. medical aid and dying isn't a primary focus of your work currently, but in um, 2017, you wrote an incredible article in the New York Times about should I help my patients die? Um, and I'm just curious your thoughts on kind of the evolution since uh, the law passed in 2016 in California, what, yeah. how you view this toolkit. I'm so glad you asked about it. You know, it's so funny. Um, I remember we, we've now been talking for several years. I'm trying to remember the first time we met was what, when was Back it? in 2020. 2020. You know, it's so interesting um, to see my own change. I've already told you about several changes that I've made over the course of my career around being so focused on interventions versus really holding space around, um, you know, understanding racial equity and inequities and my role in it. I mean, those are those are big transitions. One another big transition in my career. Actually, this thank you for making me think about this because it is. It's just a, it's a third type of transition. If you remember in the beginning when we started talking about this, I was sort of like. A little bit, you know, like, hey, I get it. I understand. I wasn't comfortable, especially with all of the PR problems that palliative care has and people death panel. I wasn't comfortable necessarily associating with movements around that. And I think I've changed. Um, there, I, I believe that there are conditions and I've seen them uh, where there really, you know, is no treatment that we can offer that can allay suffering. And, and I respect people uh, who say, you know what, I can't live with that. And that just, I don't want to live and I, I would want support to hasten my, my death. And I, I actually understand that now in a way that I didn't even three years ago. Um, I do have concerns, as I said, that this is, again, an option that is 
not going to make it to everybody. And I feel very uncomfortable about that because, and we talked about this a few years ago, I really, as someone who works in a public hospital with patients who don't speak English, uh, with patients who don't have a lot of healthcare literacy, I know that the people who can access this option are generally wealthy white people. And there's something about that that just feels unfair. It's not to say that it in and of itself is, is wrong. It's just to say, like, I'm very uncomfortable with that. And part of what's hard is that as one of the doctors of these people, it's, you know, there are a couple of patients who I've had whose suffering is so horrific that I've said, this has probably happened two or three times in the past many years. I've said to a colleague, I want to talk to them about medical aid in dying, but how do you do that? You might want to consider medical aid in dying. I mean, how do you say that to a person who doesn't really have trust in the healthcare system? And their doctor comes up to them and says, let me talk to you about medical aid. I mean, it just doesn't feel, it, it, it feels wrong. And so what I think there is a systemic inequity around access to this, which really bothers me. It really bothers me as a practitioner in a hospital like that, where there's no system for explaining or making access to this type of option uh, universal. And I, and, and being the rate limiting factor to offering that to somebody and not being comfortable. And nobody's telling me I have to offer it. I don't have to offer it. There's something really wrong about that, especially as I think about racial inequities. It, it bothers me. Again, it's not saying that people who know about it shouldn't have access to it. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that is a systemic issue that I think we really should be worrying about. That's problematic. So I just don't know what the answer to it is. Um, in the 80s, and I write about this in my book, uh, nobody extubated patients. Nobody did that. And one of my um, medical school teachers who I went back to when I was interviewing for my book, because he was one of the doctors who taught me about uh, intensive care. And he said, you know, the first time I ever extubated anybody was in like 1988. And, you know, this person was saying, I want you to take the tube. As a guy with COPD, he'll never, he was never going to get extubated. He, he said, take this out, take this out. I don't want it. And he, everybody tried to talk to this man. Well, wait a minute. What do you mean? You'll die. You'll die. He says, I don't want it. And his family was enraged and said, you can't do this. This is, you're killing my father. And some of the nurses signed off of the case because they were uncomfortable with it. And it was the first time he said, this guy doesn't want this. I am doing treatment to him that he absolutely is actively refusing. I can't do that. So they extubated him. And it was the first time he ever did that. And now we extubate people. It's, it's completely ethically acceptable to extubate people. Nobody has any problem with it if that is what is what the patient's preferences and values dictate. So these things change over time. And three years ago, five years ago, when I wrote that article, we were not comfortable affiliating or associating with that kind of option. And I think now most people have gotten used to it and started to understand that it is it is another viable alternative if there are safety measures in place and we obviously um, are assessing people for appropriateness of, of use. How do we reduce disparities and inequities in patients in general, whether they be about accessing medical aid and dying or whether they be about accessing good end of life care like palliative care hospice, whether they be about accessing a heart transplantation. I mean, We've got a serious problem in this country where patients of color are receiving poorer care than white patients. That's unacceptable. That's just unacceptable. So a lot of the solutions that I can imagine, which include diversifying the healthcare workforce, having a much more, have people know that black patients have better health care and have better health outcomes when they have black doctors. We need more black doctors. Done. We got we to figure out how to do that. That's one, you want to talk about building up trust in the system that has forsaken so many black patients. We need to, again, have more representation in, in, in the healthcare staff. Uh, we need to really attend to all of the, I mean, if you look in the medical journals, every day 
there is some article about another evidence of racial inequity, meaning the PFT machines that we use to measure people's lung uh, function, they're systematically biased against black people for getting a transplant. Same thing for, for a, a kidney transplant. I mean, all of that stuff needs to be looked at, acknowledged, and addressed and, and mitigated. Uh, th there's so much work to be done, I, I don't even know where to start. I mean, pain treatment of black patients Black patients are probably batting at like 60% of appropriate pain medication in comparison to what their white counterparts are getting for the exact same conditions. And, you know, um, we, for example, one of the scenes that we that we are working on in, in, the, in the Chaplain of Oakland is a scene of a, a woman with sickle cell disease talking about what it feels like for her to go into the hospital with a sickle cell crisis and how people treat her like she's a drug addict. I've done that. This is a serious problem. We've got to address inadequate pain management of patients of color. That's a serious, I mean, you go to a hospital, you want someone to take care of your pain. We're not doing that adequately for black patients. So, I mean, there's so many things that have to start being addressed um, quickly in order to even begin to build up trust in this system. I mean, I think medical aid and dying and VSET and all of those things are a luxury uh, item for those patients. We've, we've got to start at the basics and get them, you know, just a sense that that we are acknowledging the wounds and, and, and the neglect and, and then, and fixing them. And then maybe we can start to talk about these other sort of higher level options and opportunities. Um, but again, it's a real problem because they're not available to people, to many people of color. Um, for this reason, both because they're not available physically and also because people don't trust anything uh, like that. So it's 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 heartbreaking to me. There's some progress. Uh, the fact that the palliative care movement is now more recognized is progress. I will say I also worry mm. that palliative care is just becoming another subspecialty. And all of the groundbreaking sort of philosophy challenging uh, revolutionary things that the palliative care movement did in the late 90s, early 2000s is now moving into, oh, they're just another subspecialty. Oh yeah, call palliative care in. And we don't have, we, we become less ground shakers the way Pat was with me and more just another little consult service sitting on the side. And I'm worried in some ways that our power is actually getting sapped. So I'm not sure what direction we're going sometimes, honestly. You know, there are layers still embedded without, within palliative care and hospice that are kind of muddying the waters of, like, from a, a larger perspective for people who aren't in this work you know, so deeply as you've been for decades, still these lingering, pro vivid misperceptions are become harmful at a point to the patient. Yeah. Well, and then add in, I mean, that is the majority of what we see is just people with misperceptions and, and sort of lack of data. Um, I mean, when people see data and learn really more about what you can get from hospice and what hospice really is, most of them, many of them changed their minds. There is also the other layer, which is very complex and very upsetting to talk about of hospice isn't performing the way it used to. It's not the same hospice of the 1980s. It's not the same hospice of the 1990s. Um, hospice has a role hospice, but we, and we, we really press on our hospices that we work with, but, but it's become more of a business model. It's not the same passion, passion work that we used to see um, when it was smaller numbers of hospices and there wasn't as much of a money-making opportunity. So that's a very hard thing to acknowledge and to talk about, but it's also very important. And I think people need to know about it because people need to advocate and people need to insist on good care from hospices. And, and um, just like people, people of means can insist on having access to other options like VSET, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think those same people need to be fighting for adequate hospice 
treatment and behavior. Hospices cannot be in this just, I mean, it's a money making thing. Most, what, 80, 90% of hospices now are for profit. That's a fact. But they still have certain basic functions that they need to be able to do. And if they don't, they need to be reported. It needs to be publicized. And we need to make sure that the good, the good hospices thrive and ones who aren't doing what they need to do are corrected and have you know stretched to, to, to be better. Um, I think that's very, very important. The demand for hospice is rising significantly. I think 2017 was the first year in over a century where pe more people chose to die at home with hospice than in hospitals. So we need to make sure that that hospice, home-based palliative care, that those are functioning at their highest capabilities um, and that the good ones are rewarded and that the, the ones that need to do some work uh, are advised of that and suffer consequences if they don't. So that's really important. Yeah, this audience is a perfect audience to understand, number one, the beautiful benefits of hospice, but also the need for accountability, uh, especially as business, the business structures changed over the past, you know, five years. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So towards the end of your book, Extreme Measures, um, you have a section about contemplating your own death. And in rereading the book, it really struck me and I wanted to, to bring it up today. Um, and in that section, you describe an end of life workshop with a Buddhist named Dr. Levy. And uh, if it's okay, I'll just yeah. read an excerpt Please. from him where he asks the group who here has pictured his or her own death. And he goes on, how can we expect to help our patients plan for their deaths if we haven't planned for ours? Who would be there? What would they be saying? Who would be crying? What would you have not gotten done? Or what would you be grateful? Who would be holding your hand? Who would be standing at the foot of the bed? How might we better prepare for our future dying, Jessica? Oh, I think the first thing is about how we live. And it's about, I mean, the obvious things about having the relationships, having the people, whether they be family, friends, people who, who, who witness your life and connect with you around life. And then the second step, I think, is to make sure those people know you deeply and understand how you would want the end of your life to be. Because a lot of times you're not going to be able to advocate for yourself or talk to yourself or talk, you know, you need to have these people who are part of your life to also be part of helping the end of your life be the best that it can be. Um, and it really requires honest conversations. I mean, I talk to my kids about how I want, I know I want everybody at my bedside. I want it to be, I want them, I want my son sitting at my you know, rubbing my foot. I want my daughter sitting and feeding me soup if I can eat it. I want my dog on my chest. I, I, I know the visuals of what I want. I don't want to be as I'm dying on a machine. Uh, I want to be in my home. And um, I also don't want my family to be burdened. So I want to make sure that we figure out how, if, if I'm bedridden, uh, how are we going to take care of me so that people aren't burnt out? You know, uh, ideally, I'd like to live in the same town as my family so that there are several people around who can take shifts. And I mean, it, this is just also it's about family planning. It's about who's going to be where and how, what are we going to do when, when mom is dying? Like, who's going to be able to come? Who's not? How are we going to do it in a way? Do I need to, maybe I need to go into a nursing facility. I, I hope not. But whatever it is, these are all conversations that need to happen. They're hard. Most families don't want to have them. Most, most kids feel like they're being disloyal if they talk to their parents, acknowledging that they're going to die. I'm going to die. I hope I die before my kids. I really hope I die. But if my kids die before me, I also want to know how they feel about things. My son told me, it's really important to me that you keep me clean. 
you know what? I would not have known that about my son. I'm glad I have that information. These are the things that are part of living the best life you can live until the end. It really requires communication with those people around you. Again, they could be friends, family. They don't, it doesn't matter who they are, but they need to know. And then I think there's all the stuff that I talk about, the logistics of, you know, how to make sure that if you don't want to be on a machine in your final days, that doesn't happen. The post forms and the, the advanced directives and identifying who's going to be the, the people that the hospital speaks to. I mean, there's just a lot of logistics that need to be, which I, which I lay out in my book in the appendix, um, because I think they're really important things to take care of. Thank you for giving us a glimpse to such a personal space. Because it's a, a special space and it's sacred for you and your loved ones. And thank you for sharing that with us. Happy to happy to share. Thank you so much, Jessica. Thank you to our audience for tuning in. Um, we look forward to seeing you at our next session on day 1 of the 4th annual complete life conference. Thank you so much and see you soon.